we've allowed the cancer of relativism to infect us, so we think there are no shared universal values, and there is no freedom without those shared universals. Feit is iets wat je niet kan waarderen wanneer je het helemaal hebt. Je moet het een tijdje niet hebben en dan pas begrijp je wat je mist. Reverse the question: Can art destroy the world? And I think it can. You can choose either to be abused or not. The political news is robust. The safety of journalists. We hacked into the audience, and then all of a sudden, 300 phones would ring. You know. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. A very welcome here in the Bali, and a special welcome for uh, William Taubman, here front row, who is the author of the biography uh, of uh, Gorbachev. It's uh, translated in one month. It was published uh, late September uh, in the United States, and it's already now available in Dutch as well. And we're going to talk with him. We also talk with Pavel Palachenko, a very warm welcome to him as well. He is the former interpreter and uh, assistant of Gorbachev, and he has been there on all the historical moments. And he also published uh, an autobiography together, very closely connected with Gorbachev. He was the sort of ghost writer. And he is also connected to another uh, book, which is now being uh, published in Russia. And it might be translated soon, also in Dutch. We talk about that later on. We also have uh, Laura Staring. She used to work for NRC Handelsblad in Mos Moscow during the late 80s, early 90s. And she's going to tell us a little bit more about her experiences on that specific time. But we are going to start with a letter of our form pri former Prime Minister, Ruud Lubbers. Ruud Lubbers was at that time our Prime Minister dealing with the end of the gold Cold War, with the developments taking so uh, fastly place in uh, uh, the Russian uh, Republic on that very moment, the USSR. And he is looking back right now at the end of his career, writing letters, trying to, to, to memorize. And he wrote a letter to Gorbachev. And Vincent Rietveld, who is an actor, um, I think well known, he studied in 2002 uh, in Maastricht, but he's been seen in many plays, and he also is one of the founding fathers of uh, Toneelgroep De Warme Winkel. He is going to present us the letter of Ruud Lubbers. Vincent Rietveld. Uh, 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 yes. Yeah, first I, I thought I should dress up as Ruud Lubbers uh, for good old time's sake. But then I, I looked at YouTube how he looked like and then I saw that about every Dutch comedian already has been personalizing him in the last 20 years. So uh, I, uh, I just read his letter uh, first to us. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, I'm unable to attend this evening dedicated to the life and times of Michael Gorbachev. As prime minister, I have been a witness and on several occasions more than that to some of the important and dramatic moments during the Gorbachev era. I have met Michael and his wife a few times. And reading William Taubman's fascinating biography, which is at the heart of this event in the Bali, brings back many personal and political memories. Since I cannot speak here tonight, Mr. Taubman's Dutch publisher suggested that I write a short letter in commemoration of our times together, to be delivered to Mr. Gorbachev in Moscow and to be read here in public. I'm very happy to do so. Dear Michael, on the desk in my study is a photograph of you, Raisa, and me having a conversation. It was taken in the days after the end of the Soviet Union, and it has been on my desk ever since. It is a token of friendship and appreciation for your humanity and your courage both as a person and as a politician. Every time I look at it, and I do so often, the image brings back many memories of that remarkable time. For me, it all started in the early 70s when I was Minister of Economic Affairs, a position that brought me to Moscow several times. But maybe more important in view of the later chain of events, 
was the close friendship that in the 80s developed between Indira Gandhi and me. Those days she was chairman of UNCTAD, which is the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, and the daughter of a famous political family in India. I was a young Dutch Minister of Economic Affairs. That year, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development had its meeting in Belgrade. Indira and me became good friends. As a result, as a result she, she suggested her son Rajiv to get in touch with me if he were to choose a career in politics. As we all know, he did. He became Prime Minister. And so it happened that after returning from his first state visit to the White House, he came to see me in The Hague on his way home. It was just a day before I had to deliver my speech in the Houtrusthalle, I'm sorry, about the positioning of the nuclear weapons in the Netherlands. The apotheosis of the enormous anti-nuclear demonstration in our country. During our meeting, I asked Rajiv to make a stopover in Moscow and to inform you, Michael, in detail about my views on the Dutch nuclear position. And he did. So at the same moment I addressed the peace demonstration in The Hague, Rajiv relayed my thoughts to you in the Kremlin. And I like to believe it played a role in the treaty that came out of the Reykjavik summit. Back in New Delhi, Rajiv reported to me about your conversation and that you had made clear that you did believe a deal with Reagan would be possible. Thanks to the results of the summit, the Netherlands were able to decide not to place intermediate nuclear weapons while remaining a, a loyal NATO member at the same time. Sadly enough, Michael, I am aware that when it comes to global zero nuclear, Reykjavik, however promising it was, contributed more to an ongoing US supremacy on nuclear power than it did to global zero. After the end of the Soviet Union, we stayed in touch, especially over our support for your Green Cross initiative. Our first meeting was at the Katz House, where you and me and Reisa talked frankly and openly about your own personal history and your desire to end military interventions in Soviet satellite states. It was over that meaningful conversation that the phot photograph on my desk was taken. Very fond memories. After reading William Taubman's biography, I know more about your life and times than I did before. I have immensely enjoyed reading it. It deepens my feelings of friendship and admiration for you. Sincerely yours, Ruth Lubbers. Yeah. Vincent Rietveld, thank you so much for this uh, nice introduction and thank you for giving us uh, the letter of Ruth Lubbers to uh, Michael Kobachev. Um, the 1st of October, that's it is today, and it's, an, I think, an interesting moment in time because exactly 100 years ago, the October Revolution of 1917 took place on the 9th of October. So we're sort of celebrating 100 years of historical developments in the Russia area. And I think Michael Gorbachev is a child of that period. If you look at this beautiful biography, you see where he's come from when he was born and the developments he has been witnessed over the years towards his position as uh, the leader of Russia. Um, it's a sort of mini biography of Russia as a whole. Um, and it's beautifully written and uh, introduced uh, and, and, and historically, um, how you say, uh, framed by William Taubman. You were born in 1941 uh, in New York City. Uh, you're an American political scientist and you all still wrote a biography of Nikita Khrushchev, who won the Pulitzer Prize in 2004. And also the National Book Critics Award, maybe that's even more important, in 2003. Um, you're now currently a veteran Snell Professor of Political Science at Amherst College. You have had many chairs and positions over the years. Um, and um, you have now uh, finished your biography last September. It came out in the United States. It's now presented in Dutch here in uh, early October. And we are very proud and we're very, not, we're very uh, happy that you're here. And I will ask you uh, to give us the introduction on the book on Kobachev.
Thank you very much. I am ashamed to say this is my first visit to Amsterdam, uh, but it won't be my last. Thomas Carlyle, British historian of the 19th century, once said something important, but actually partly right, partly wrong. What he said was, the history of the world is but the biography of great men. As you can see immediately from the word men, there's something wrong with that statement. And of course, there are many things about the world that constitute its history, social movements, impersonal forces, international trends. So it's not quite right. But it is right about Mikhail Gorbachev. He was a great man, and his history is absolutely central, his biography is absolutely central to understanding the history of our time. More than anyone else, he destroyed the communist regime in the Soviet Union. More than anyone else, he ended the Cold War. He did not do these things alone, but he was central to both. He presided, as it says up there, unintentionally over the collapse of the Soviet Union. He changed his country and the world, but neither as much as he wished. Now, one reason he could do these things was that he had immense power as the leader of the Soviet Union, the leader of a, well, we could call it a still totalitarian country when he took over, but perhaps we should call it a post-totalitarian country. He had more power than most leaders of democratic countries in which there are more constraints and restraints. And another very important fact, which leads us back to his biography, is that he was unique in the sense that no one else in his leadership group would have done what he did. Even though they selected him to be their leader, they one by one turned against him as he proceeded with what he was going to do. There were three men only who remained with him almost to the very end. The name Eduard Shevardnadze, you remember the foreign minister, Alexander Yakovlev, Gorbachev's chief ally, and Vadim Medvedev. But if they did stay with him to the end, the only reason that they were there to do so was that he either appointed them or kept them on. So in that sense, it was he, as an individual leader, who made the difference. Now, when you have a leader who makes a difference, in this unique way, that constitutes an invitation to try to understand his personality. Because if he doesn't do what the others would have done in his place, that suggests that some of what he does, maybe most of it, is coming out of himself. That is, reflecting his character, reflecting internal drives and compulsions. And that leaves us back to biography. Now, in my book, there are several questions that I attempt to answer. I'm going to summarize them very quickly here and give you a thumbnail quick answer, although the book is 852 pages, including footnotes, and I see the Dutch edition is even longer. I'll talk to the publisher about that afterwards. So the first question is, how did Gorbachev become Gorbachev? How did a peasant boy whose high school essay in praise of Stalin won a prize. How did he become the man who was the gravedigger for the Soviet regime? How did such a man ever in the world get chosen to be the leader of the regime that he was going to help to destroy? What third question, what were his aims when he initially took over in March 1985? And how did they become this vast project and undertaking, which I just mentioned, and we'll talk about a bit more. Did he seek from the start to do everything he did, or did it occur gradually as he came to understand more and more of what he was up against? And another question, how could he possibly have undertaken to change this regime? to democratize Russia, a country which had hardly known democracy in its entire history, to move a command economy in the direction of a market economy, to end the Cold War. How could he possibly have imagined that he could su succeed in this? And then, alas, we know 
that he did not entirely succeed and that in fact as time went by he ran into more and more difficulties and was eventually forced from power in December 1991. So yet another question that I'm interested in is how did this affect him? How did he react to the partial, if not more than that, failure of this great undertaking? And finally, and I suspect I won't have time to address this at all, what was the role of the outside world in his fate? How did it react to him when he came in and how did it treat him during the time he was there? Now, very quickly, thumbnail answers to these questions. How did Gorbachev become Gorbachev? I devote a chapter, a rather long chapter actually, to his childhood. And the way I would summarize it is this is a man born in 1931 who lived in terrible times. Famine, collectivization, terror, war. The Nazis occupied his village for three months or four months in 1942. More famine, late Stalinism. How could a man like this emerge and try to do what he did? Well, the second part of the answer is terrible times, but he emerges full of confidence, full of optimism. Interestingly, the book that Pavel Palashchenko mentioned that Gorbachev has just finished is called I Remain an Optimist. And one of the central features of his character is his optimism, his confidence, his self-confidence, and one more thing that's central to trying to democratize your country, his trust in other people. You have to trust people if you want to give them power. So, so much for his childhood, to which I devote a uh, much longer space. He went to Moscow University from 1950 to 1955, Stalin's last three years, and then a couple more. Like other people, many of you, I'm sure, in this room who've gone to universities, you emerge with some questions you didn't have before you went, some doubts about what you had thought was settled in your own mind. In addition, in this university, which was the elite university of the Soviet Union, in which there were still professors who had been trained before the revolution or during the 1920s, he met wonderful young people, and that happens too in universities. One of them absolutely central to his career was a Czech student named Zdenek Mlinaš. Described by other students that I interviewed, former students of Moscow University, as Gorbachev's best friend at Moscow University. This is the man who in 1968 was the chief ideologist of the Prague Spring, working along with Alexander Dubček. Now in 1950, you can be sure Dup uh, uh, Milinash was not yet the man who worked with Dubček in 1958, but he was already an idealist who wanted to do better than the world he saw around him in Moscow, who wanted to return to what he thought were the original ideals of the revolution and of communism. And, and on one occasion, there are many occasions I describe in the book, but on one occasion, they went to see a film, which to use an ox, it was an oxymoron. It was a Stalinist musical comedy, Cossacks of the Kuban. And in this film, the, co the collective farmers happily bring in the harvest, and then the young milkmaids go off to the store and buy all kinds of charming dresses for themselves and other goods. And while they're watching this film, Gorbachev whispers to Mlinash, it's not true. It's only brute force that pushes them to do their work. And as for buying dresses in the store, there's nothing to buy. So you get a glimpse, but just a glimpse. After Moscow, you know, oh, I almost forgot, I mustn't forget. The second key person, Raisa, Raisa Titryantka, Raisa Gorbacheva, his wife, a woman who was younger than he, but ahead of him in the university, in some ways more sophisticated than he at that time, better read. And he describes her, both of them at the time, as maximalists, meaning they wouldn't settle for half measures. But he says, I later as a politician learned to compromise. She never did. He consulted her later on in life as leader about almost everything. She was with him all the way and she is a central figure. And perhaps Pavel will say a bit more about them and their marriage as he observed it. The next stage is he climbs the ladder of the Communist Party in the provinces in Stavropol, 
where I visited a couple of times with my wife to interview friends, colleagues, enemies, and all the rest. And what I came away with studying his time in Stavropol and listening to these people was that ironically Gorbachev struck many of them at the time as the perfect product of communism, the new Soviet man, a believer, enlightened, efficient, dedicated, treated his wife wonderfully well in contrast to a lot of the people we heard about and met. And so we have an interesting irony here, which is this man who seems to be a kind of perfect product of communist education is promoted for that very reason, along with some others, by people like Yuri Andropov, later the head of the Soviet secret police, Kasigin, the prime minister, Suslov, the chief ideologist. He's promoted because he seems the perfect product and he reminds them of their original idealism, which has been now layered over with a lot of cynicism. How does he get from there to the very top and become the top Soviet leader? Well, here, my, the phrase that I find useful is to say, it helped that the people he succeeded, Brezhnev, Andropov, Chernenko, nearly dead men walking, one might say, were not just, they were, they were not a hard act to follow. They were too easy. It was too easy for Gorbachev at the age of 53 or 54 to seem full of vigor that they didn't have, intelligence that they might have left behind. And so he was promoted. The only other 53 or four year old was Romanov, a good name in czarist times, but not in Soviet times. The Leningrad party leader who was clearly a drunkard and not set out to be the leader. So he is the leader. And he begins, as I see it, and as he himself says, with moderate, very moderate economic reforms, with somewhat more radical glossness, openness, which later becomes free speech. And then he moves gradually toward what he sees as the big breakthrough in 1988-89. Mostly free elections, a genuine functioning parliament instead of a rubber stamp. Glasnost is now almost fully free speech. These are the things he moves to. And I would say, others have said this too, I don't know whether Pavel will, Pavel will agree. By the time he finishes, Gorbachev has become in effect a Western social democrat, although he never breathes those words to his colleagues. And he continues to be a devotee of Lenin, which is kind of hard to reconcile, Leninism and Western social democracy, but they both seem to be part of his worldview. Well, this is the great project, and as, we, as I said in the beginning, and as you know all too well, it begins to come apart. And by 1990, he's heading downhill. And in 1991, it's even worse. And in August 1991, as you remember, the coup occurs, or the abortive coup, and he's held under house arrest at his villa in Foros. So I tried to make sense of how this affected this man who was full of confidence that he could bring off a kind of miracle. And in my view, again, I don't know what Pavel will say, but I think I can see him showing the signs of this struggle and of these failures. He doesn't come apart. He's still going forward. He's still trying very hard. His wife says there's no impact at all, like, although he's exhausted. But others like Chernyayev, Anatoly Chernyayev, his main uh, aide for foreign policy and for much of domestic policy too, begins to see him breaking up or showing the strain in a very serious way. And it's really this that leads me, along with other things, to characterize him as a whole as a tragic hero. Heroic for what he tried to do and for what he accomplished, the end of totalitarianism, bringing democracy to Russia and to the Russian, to the Soviet Union and its people for the first time, ending the Cold War together with Western statesmen. He is a hero, but he's a tragic hero in the sense that he is brought low in the end. Brought low partly, maybe even mostly, by the immovable forces which he tries to move. The hardliners who break with him, the radical Democrats who forsake him for Yeltsin, the sheer nature of the Soviet Union and Russia itself with its tradition of authoritarianism 
and anti-Westernism. A tragic hero. I'll end by saying one or two words about the outside world. The outside world, and particularly the West, at first ignores him or doesn't trust him, worries about whether he's for real. And then it embraces him in Western Europe and in the United States. And then finally, it abandons him at the end when he desperately needs economic aid but doesn't get as much as he needs. I'm particularly interested in the Americans because I think the real puzzle is that if Ronald Reagan, the arch conservative, could become Gorbachev's champion, as he was, then why didn't in his first year in power George H.W. Bush continue what Reagan had begun? When they met at Governor's Island, where Pavel was there in December 1988, Bush promised Gorbachev that he would pick up where Reagan had left off, and he even joked that Reagan would be calling him on the phone from California to make sure that he did. But instead, Bush declared a pause for several months to reassess Gorbachev and make sure he was for real. And that was because his advisors, Vice President, no, then Secretary of Defense Cheney, and Brent Scowcroft, the National Security Advisor, and Robert Gates, didn't believe that Gorbachev was for real. Scowcroft thought he was trying to smother the West with kindness, and that by being such a smiley-faced communist, he would lead the West to lower its guard. Well, by the end of the year, Bush had come around. They met at Malta, and after that, they were very close until the very end. But I think, looking back, that that year, 1989, was a time when if Bush had followed through on what Reagan had begun, it would have given even more wind to Gorbachev's sales. We don't know whether the end would have been different. Probably not. But looking back, I regret that, both as a biographer and as an American. I will stop here. And I think my instructions are to move to the table. Well, William Taubman, thank you so much for this great introduction on this great book, um, on this great man. Um, maybe first to start with, what's your personal connection with Russian politics? Why are you so much connected to it? <laughs> I've often asked myself that question. I think it had something to do with the fact that my maternal grandfather came from Nikolaev and told us when I was growing up, my brother and I, that he had been actually a chairman of a local Soviet there, and that he had escaped later when he was threatened with arrest. But I was also fascinated in the 1950s growing up with the Cold War, Khrushchev, Eisenhower, Kennedy. I later wrote, as you said, a biography of Khrushchev. And one other thing, as early as high school and then in college, I got fascinated with the question of what produced Stalinism? Uh, and was it, as some people said, anti Marxist, anti-communist, was Stalin somehow to be understood as a mass murderer in the line begun with all its idealism by Marx? Or was he a perversion, a betrayer of what Marx had begun? This was a sort of teenager's question, which led me to major in Russian history, and I went on from there. What was your answer? <laughs> Uh, my answer is there may be some roots, some roots in some aspects of Marxism in the sense of certainty that utopia is waiting for us, which in the hands of some people justifies force used to bring it about. But there are an awful lot of turning points along the way. You have to get to Lenin. From Lenin, you have to have a civil war. In the civil war, Stalin has to be rise to the top as the most brutal man around. Then you have the new economic policy, which is a chance to go in another direction. Then you have Nikolai Bukharin, on whom I wrote my college senior thesis, who has a different notion of where they should go. So if, it, if the turning point had turned at any of these moments, and there's one other turning point, Stalin might have been hit by a truck and killed, that would have made another difference. I want to just make that one point again. Just as Gorbachev was, I think, almost all powerful, in the, at least in the beginning, and unique, so were a couple of other Soviet leaders. Stalin, Khrushchev, 
Khrushchev, for example, who else would have denounced Stalin in 1956 of all of his colleagues? Probably only Beria, but Khrushchev took care of him. Uh, who else would have sent missiles to Cuba? Only Khrushchev. Funny, because the Soviet Union is a place where Marxism prepared people to think that impersonal forces, material, the economy, shape history. And it turns out that individual leaders shaped history more than that, at least in my view. So in what way do you think Gorbachev was really a different leader than his predecessors? What really makes him stand out differently? Well, as I said, nobody else in his circle would have done what he did. The people who chose him in March 1985 chose him because he was young and vigorous and they thought he would carry out some modest reforms which would improve the system. And I think he himself in the beginning wanted to modernize the system and make it more efficient and more humane. Uh, eventually, I think he came to want to create communism with a human face along the model of Zdenek Mlinas in, Pro in the Prague Spring. Um, but none of them wanted to do this. So that's the mystery that I try to unravel in this book. Well, what struck me was that you described the moment he has to decide whether or not he likes to go to school. And in whether he likes or not to go to school. And uh -huh. that it took for him about 24 hours to understand that he really needs it. So in a split of a second, so to say, in this man's history, he's going from away from school well, this very... happened after, after the war ended in that part of, of, of southern Russia where he lived. He, it was time to go back to school, yeah. and he'd been out of school for two years. Right. So he went back and he sat there, and he felt he didn't belong. I sensed that he felt he didn't feel competent. During the war, living through it himself, while his father was off at the front, he had come to take on responsibility. He considered himself a mature young man. And to be put back in a situation where he had to struggle with a classroom, I think was more psychologically than he wanted to endure. But his mother, who was a very complicated figure herself and in her relations with him, uh, went off to buy him some books, sold off some clothes to buy books. And he says that evening he began to read the books in his room and was inspired again to go back to school. This is one of these turning points. Well, to me, it also tells me a little bit about the fact that someone is able to look at himself, to reflect upon this position and change that position overnight. In this case, yes, but there are moments from his childhood, some of them revealed by his girlfriend who told her story not to me, but to some other interviewers, which suggests he was a kind of arrogant kid in mm -hmm. his own way. There's this wonderful story in which um, she tells, in which one day he bawled her out, he chastised her. She was the editor of the student wall newspaper, and she hadn't done her job. Not only did he bawl her out to her face, when the editorial group met, he, he chastised her. And then, 10 minutes later, as they were walking down the street out of school, he asked her out on a date to a movie, of which there weren't many in that village. And she said to him, how can you do this? One minute you're acting as if I'm incompetent, and the next minute you're asking me out on a date. And his answer was, well, Yulia, her name, these are two different realms. This bespeaks to me, a, and it, this is the way she saw it, a kind of self-assuredness almost raised to the level of arrogance. He also turns out in school to have been the only kid in the school who would challenge teachers. Another occasion, they were at a play, a movie, and he turns to his mathematics teacher and says, I didn't explain, I didn't understand what you said. Can you explain it better? Can you imagine a Soviet student challenging a teacher in that way? Do you think that this sort of characteristics also helped him to climb up the ladder and especially to, to climb upon the so-called middle management of the system? Well, when he writes about climbing that ladder and he talks about his peers, his colleagues, 
his fellow bureaucrats. He says, again, I was a head higher than they were, so to speak, meaning I was better educated, I was smarter. And he says they resented that. And he said I had to restrain myself. I had to be careful about how I behaved. And his boss, one of his bosses from, who came down from Moscow and was the head of that province, uh, Kulakov, uh, you can see as you read this history that Kulakov respects him a great deal, eventually contributes to his promotion, but in the meantime, he tames him. He criticizes him as if to say, this guy, Gorbachev, has a swelled head. He thinks too highly of himself, so I'm going to take him down a few pegs. So it's a comp it, this, this confidence is central to understanding his willingness to change his country and the world, but it also becomes, it leads to tactical mistakes because he's so confident, for example, that he can defeat Yeltsin or control Yeltsin. And yet in the end, it's Yeltsin who defeats him. And he's also confident that he can, he can keep the hardliners, the Ligachovs and others, the hardline communists, as he says, they're like a rabid dog and I have to keep them on a tight leash. And what do they do in the end? They try to put them under house arrest. So in this sense, this confidence, this certainty, this, uh, this self-confidence is both, I think, a secret to his success, and it also helps to explain some of his mistakes which lead him into trouble. And would you say that in, in the end he under or overestimated his own position? I think in the end he overestimated what he could do in his position. I, I don't want to make him sound, as I came to understand him, as a man with no doubt, no doubt about himself, with never a black moment. Uh, because there are moments when you can see uh, flashes of doubt and even insecurity. But compared to Khrushchev, whom I also worked on, who was full of insecurities because he didn't have more than a third grade education and knew he was uncultured. Gorbachev feels that he is cultured. He's become an intellectual. He has a philosophical cast of mind. His first impression of Schultz uh, and Bush, who represents Reagan at the, at the Chernyenko funeral, is that they were mediocre and that he is a bit higher. Again, I don't want to make him seem totally full of himself and full of self-conceit. When you meet him, he comes across as natural and informal and warm and even modest. But there was a core of strength and certainty without which I don't think you can understand the man and his career. And in the end, you can say that it's maybe also in the Russian mind to set up yourself against that, a certain, a certain anti-intellectualism, a sort of anti-high esteem. Well, I think among the people he circulated with, the people we met in Stavropol, my wife Jane, who's here, and I, they were uh, several steps below him. You could see why he felt superior to them. And Brezhnev, Andropov aspired to be something of an intellectual. Uh, Oleg Bogomolov, the head of one of the institutes who worked for Andropov in the 1960s, tells the story. He told us the story of how one day he noticed on, on uh, Andropov's desk several classics, including Mantegna and others, and he said, what are you reading those books? Why, why do you have them? And Andropov's answer was, so I can speak with you and my other young aides. In other words, he aspired to more. I should say one other thing, because I'm talking about strength, and this is another irony. Gorbachev was a very strong man, but he struck many Russians, especially as the years went by, as weak. And some of the reasons they, some of, some of what he did that struck them as weak, we would consider, at least I would, as strengths. One, one person we encountered said, you know how weak he was? He changed his mind or he listened to others. They, and we can talk more, and Pavel can talk more about this, people like Putin strike uh, 
Russians as having a kind of strong hand. And Gorbachev had a strong hand, but he preferred to be more accommodating. He tried to r reconcile the irreconcilable. He tried to foster compromise and consensus. And for too many Russians after a while, this seemed weakness. Okay, William Tavlin, thank you so much for the moment. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as said, we are, uh, have a small intervention now by Lara Staring. She was a Moscow correspondent of uh, NSA Handelsblad in uh, the late 80s, early 90s. She was visiting the big congresses and conferences and uh, watching what was happening on the moment there. And she brings back, uh, back memories right now. She sets the stage for us. Uh, Lara Staring, may I invite you to do that right now. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Being in, uh, in Moscow uh, in the Gorbachev era was uh, quite, quite a surprise. It was an, it, it, I think it's the best thing that ever happened into my, in my uh, professional life because it was all the time 24-7 working, all the time trying to follow what was going on. Every day uh, you were on the front page of the newspaper. Um, and it was almost impossible to understand uh, uh, the scope and uh, the speed of, uh, of the events. And that's why I'm especially very grateful to Mr. Taupman because uh, I'm, I've almost finished the book and it's fascinating. And uh, it's, uh, it's amazing for me who was inside the thick of all these, uh, these uh, historical events uh, to, 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 to see how he puts it into perspective. Um, so now a, sh a short column with my memories. Um, one of the most electrifying memories I have on Mikhail Gorbachev was the way he orchestrated the 2000 deputies of the first more or less freely elected Congress of People's Representatives that started on May 25, 1989. For two weeks, it kept the whole population of the Soviet Union glued to the television screen. It was the talk of the town, I would say. It was the talk of the country. It was the talk of the empire. Gorbachev's main opponent in the debates was the dissident physicist Andrei Sakharov, who hammered the last nails in the coffin of the Communist Party. At the end, he openly demanded the abolishment of the notorious Article 6 of the Constitution about the leading role of the Communist Party in the country. This was a revolution and the foreboding of the end of the one-party state. To witness this titanic fight between the man who wanted to reform the system, Gorbachev, and the man who wanted to demolish it, Sakharov, it was a true, truly historical sensation. And we journalists were as fascinated as the Russians. But the Congress was more than a battle between two strong personalities. It showed how big the internal problems of the country were, were and how impossible it was to keep the empire afloat. Skillful as Gorbachev manipulated the deputies, it became clear that the burden was far too big and the resistance too strong for one party leader. Gorbachev till this day deplores the collapse of the Soviet Union and blames his mortal enemy Boris Yeltsin for it. But if the chaotic Congress in 1989 that I witnessed proved one anything, it was that history would soon take over. During 12 days, deputies from all over the Soviet Union took the floor to complain about the hopeless situation in their regions. Just a few examples. Uh, I wrote this story uh, back in 89. An Estonian who pleads for independence of Estonia. An Uzbek who warns against the dangers of monoculture of cotton in, in Uzbekistan. A Kalmyk who talks about alarming child mortality in his province. A Lithuanian who immediately wants to discuss the ominous Molotov-Ribbentrop pact between Stalin and Hitler that lead, led to the annexation of the Baltic states by the USSR. A Moscovite who wants instantaneously to purge the KGB. 
a Georgian who demands the arrest of a general who used violence against peaceful demonstrators in Tbilisi. An Ingush asking for attention to Stalin's murderous deportation of his people during World War II. A, Mol a Moldovan demanding the release of innocent people in jail in Chisinau. A Ukrainian who wants the dangerous nuclear power station in Crimea shut down immediately. A vice president being accused of collaboration with organized crime. And a political leader, Gorbachev, who is being angrily attacked for his failing reforms. This was it. Homo Sovieticus exploded in front of everybody's eyes. Mikhail Gorbachev was the conductor trying to, stay, to steer clear of all the cliffs and abysses that opened up in front of 200 million spectators all over the Union. In those 12 days, productivity in the country definitely plummeted to an absolute low, but society was exhilarated. Looking back, it is almost impossible to imagine the heat of that moment and to understand how shocking all these speeches were to the audience. It was the first time in Soviet history that people were given full freedom of speech in a political context, and in the end it resulted in the devastation of the system. Gorbachev's brinkmanship during these days was extraordinary, but it did not save him. Glasnost had taken over and Boris Yeltsin was waiting in the corridors of power. During breaks in the Congress, you could all of a sudden bump into Mikhail Gorbachev, surrounded by agitated delegates who tried to talk him into something. He seemed tireless and kept lobbying, but by the end of the week he was exhausted. His hypnotizing brown eyes became bleary. His tactics, keep talking until the others drop dead, failed on him. In his autobiography, Sakharov formulated it thus. The first People's Congress deprived all people of our country from all illusions with which we lulled to sleep the whole world. Now it was clear to everyone, there is only one choice, straight ahead or the abyss. Actually, Gorbachev agreed with this. By the end of the year, Sakharov died and Gorbachev openly honored him by saying, you could agree with Sakharov or not, but he was a sincere man who stood for his principles and convictions. For that, I have the greatest respect. It would take another two years before the Soviet Union would collapse. And another 10 years for Vladimir Putin to call this the big biggest tragedy of the 20th century. Nostalgia for the safety of the communist gated community is growing in Russia. But I remember the humiliating craving for Western jeans, panties and soap in the Brezhnev era when I studied in Leningrad. And the lack of toilet paper, usually replaced by the ink-stained pages of the newspaper Pravda. I also remember the queues for bread in front of the bakeries in the beginning of the 90s in Moscow, after the collapse of communism. The transition to capitalism was painful, but Moscow has changed into a hipster city since, totally over the top. Preservation of the system was no option, and Gorbachev realized this way before his fellow apparatchiks. That makes him a truly, truly historical figure. I'm afraid he will not reap any gratitude before his death. That's a good old Russian tradition. The people prefer Putin who gave bread and sausage. But Gorbachev opened the gates. He gave people freedom and the first glimmer of self-respect. The current Russian leadership, alas, seems to have a different interpretation of that important heritage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pavel Palachenko, it's uh, great having you here. was born in 1949 near, uh, near Moscow, Moscow Oblast, and you graduated from the Marie Storos Moscow Institute of Foreign Languages in 1972. You uh, became a high-level Soviet conference interpreter and was the chief uh, English interpreter for Michael Gorbachev and 
as already mentioned, Soviet Foreign Minister Eduard Chervanetze in the period 1985-1991. You wrote a book about your own memoirs. You cooperated on the autobiography of, uh, of Gorbachev. You're still very much befriended and you follow him closely. Um, and I hope you give a good insight in the man. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, well, let, let me start just like uh, Bill. Bill started saying that this was the first time he was in uh, Amsterdam. It's not my first time in Amsterdam. The first time I was in Amsterdam was uh, in 1977. And uh, quite a few people to whom I told that uh, uh, said to me, well, I wasn't yet born when you were the first time in Amsterdam. And I see many young people here, which is uh, nice. I was here when I was working at the UN uh, in the Russian simultaneous interpretation section of the United Nations uh, Secretariat. And um, uh, I was going on home leave to Moscow and we were allowed one stop over and I chose Amsterdam. So since that time, 40 years have passed. It was actually the beginning of my career in languages, which brought me eventually to work for Mikhail Gorbachev. And uh, had anyone uh, told me that I would spend uh, much of the rest of my life with Mikhail Gorbachev up until now, I probably wouldn't have believed that, but that is what happened. I was with him in 85 uh, during the first summit with Ronald Reagan. I was with him until the end, until his speech on uh, Christmas Day on the 25th of December 1991 when he stepped down, when he announced his uh, resignation from the post of the President of the Soviet Union. And uh, it so happened that I stayed with him. I decided to leave government service uh, when he stepped down. And since that time, I've been working as a freelance interpreter and also working with Mikhail Gorbachev in the Gorbachev Foundation, uh, helping him also as interpreter during his uh, trips abroad, including his many trips to the United States uh, on lecture tours. So it's been uh, a large part of uh, my life. And uh, I thought, well, what should I talk about? About my impressions or maybe about uh, uh, what I saw as Gorbachev's evolution during his over six years in power and afterwards, because there has been an evolution. And I thought, well, I'll try to talk a little bit about all that. And then I wanted to maybe spend a little time, perhaps during this talk or maybe later during, during Q&A, discussing some of the criticisms of Gorbachev, of which there are many, and trying to, if not disprove those criticisms, uh, trying to show the complexity of the uh, challenges that he faced, and basically how easy it is to criticize and how difficult it is to act, how difficult it is to face the kind of legacy that he inherited, the kind of challenges and the kind of complexity that he inherited and doing something, actually acting rather than, uh, well, um, rather than not acting. And he acted, he did, he did. So I wanted to spend a little time on that. But first, my first impression of Gorbachev. It's a series of accidents that brings you to become an interpreter for uh, the leader of the country. A series of accidents, it's uh, not like when you become an official in the government or in the Communist Party. That's a career to which people aspire and the goal that they reach. When you are an interpreter, well, I started my career, as I said, at the United Nations. I worked for five years at the UN, then I returned to Moscow, and it was at that time that, quite by accident, they decided to expand the translation and interpretation department of the foreign ministry, and I was hired. Had that not happened, I would probably never have become Gorbachev's interpreter. Then. 
when Gorbachev became the Soviet leader and Eduard Shevardnadze became the foreign minister, the Americans suggested that during the negotiations, uh, they should make use of simultaneous interpretation, not the consecutive interpretation that was usual, which takes uh, basically the same time as the speech, and that makes any negotiations twice as long as with simultaneous interpretation. So they suggested uh, that why not try to use simultaneous interpretation during the first meeting between uh, Sheridanadze and Schultz. And Sheridanadze agreed. Some people in the uh, foreign ministry were against it, but Shevard Nadze agreed. And uh, because I had experience, I had the record uh, of uh, working as a simultaneous interpreter uh, at the UN, they chose me to do that. Another, basically another accident. And then, of course, the Geneva meeting, the Geneva summit of uh, Gorbachev and Reagan. In my view, a truly historic summit. In my view, a kind of underrated, underestimated meeting uh, that produced a lot more than many people expected. And again, because they used simultaneous interpretation, um, I was asked to, to do that summit among a couple of other interpreters. And finally, they settled, kind of settled on me. And I was in Reykjavik, I was uh, in um, Washington during the so-called INF summit when 30 years ago the treaty eliminating all intermediate range nuclear weapons was signed. And I was in all the subsequent summits with Gorbachev, Reagan and, and Bush. So it's basically a series of accidents. But it did give me a window on uh, the developments that ended the Cold War. And uh, I think that my first impression of Mikhail Gorbachev was, if not complete, subsequent events showed that it was the right impression. That is to say, I felt that this is more than just a politician. I think that it almost immediately clicked uh, the feeling that he was uh, a moral person, that he had more than just an interest in political victories, in being on top, etc. And that proved right. When one of his closest associates, the closest associate, I would say, who already has been mentioned here by Bill, Anatoly Chernaev, was asked, what was it? that made Gorbachev different? What was it that made him persevere despite all the obstacles, despite all the problems and failures? What was it that made him persevere with the democratic process, with the introduction of democracy in Russia? It was the introduction of democracy from the top. Initially, no one really demanded democracy. That was not what even the boldest people in, in, in the intelligentsia demanded. What was it that made him continue with the democratic experiment? And Chernev's answer was it was the moral core that he inherited from his family that existed in him during his career in the Communist Party that stayed with him even though, of course, you know, the bureaucratic career is not what you expect to produce moral values, moral principles, etc. And um, I think I felt that from the start. It is often said that Perestroika had two distinct periods. The period that when, when Gorbachev basically experimented with the old system and wanted to improve the old system a little bit, and the period when he started to dismantle the old system and replace it with the elements of the new system, of the democratic system, uh, which he tried to establish. And this is uh, true. The uh, Congress of People's Deputies that was described uh, here by uh, the previous speaker definitely was the beginning of the new period. The elections, uh, relatively free elections, certainly elections that are a lot freer than they are now in Russia, that preceded 
that Congress were the beginning of the second phase of perestroika. But there is one thing that uh, the two periods have in common, and that is that Gorbachev wanted to humanize the country. He wanted to make the country more democratic, even when he did not yet often use that word. He wanted to people, the people to have a say and to be involved in changing the country. He trusted the people. He was a human being. He actually liked other human beings. And that makes him really different from uh, many other politicians, both Soviet, uh, Russian, and, and others. And that was also, I think, this, this moral core, this humanizing core, that was also, I think, the foundation of his foreign policy. So here you can see the connection between his foreign policy and his domestic uh, policy. Uh, here too, I think, the moral element, the attempt the heroic attempt, I think, to bring together morality and politics was the hallmark of his foreign policy as well as his domestic policy. Uh, today, uh, very often, particularly in Russia, Gorbachev's foreign policy is described as just a series of concessions that he made to the West, in particular to the United States. But look at what really happened during those six years. Gorbachev's legacy was the Soviet Union that was isolated, that had a terrible relationship with the United States, with the European countries, because of the deployment of the SS-20 missiles and the counter deployment that Americans started in, in Europe, including this country. It was a war in Afghanistan where hundreds of soldiers were lost every year. It was a terrible confrontation with China. It was involvement in all kinds of regional conflicts from Cambodia to Nicaragua. Gorbachev changed all that. So was that a series of con uh, concessions? No, it was a series of bold steps to end the country's isolation, to start reintegrating it in the world in the global community, and it was successful. As George Shultz has said on a number of occasions, the Cold War really ended long before the Soviet Union ended its existence. And the unification of Germany, the common stand that the Soviet Union and the West took against the invasion of Kuwait by Saddam Hussein, all of those things showed that the Cold War really was already over. And that was not you know, a series of concessions, but as I said, a total change in the international environment of the Soviet Union and subsequently of Russia. And it was not a smooth process. It was not smooth sailing when Gorbachev had had the first one-on-one -on -one meeting with Ronald Reagan. He came back from that tete-a-tete. -tete, and when asked, what's your impression of Reagan? He said, well, he is a real dinosaur, a Cold War dinosaur. And Reagan said something similar, as we later learned, about Gorbachev. He said, Gorbachev is a die-hard Bolshevik. That's all he is. And from that point, they started gradually building trust. And as we know from Ronald Reagan's letters subsequent to his uh, retirement, subsequent to his presidency, Reagan in private letters, in his communications, continued to appreciate Gorbachev, continued to show trust and respect for Gorbachev. And I would say, despite all the problems and obstacles that came up, Gorbachev continued and still continues to have a lot of respect for Ronald Reagan. Trust is the most difficult thing to build. And the fact that we were able not just to end the Cold War, 
but to develop trust in relations between the two nuclear superpowers. That is, of course, an enormous achievement. So I'll leave uh, some of what I have prepared to say to Q&A, but before uh, doing that, I would just like uh, to perhaps follow up on what Bill Talbot has said and say a few words about that uh, episode, to me a very important episode, that shows how complicated and how um, difficult to evaluate some of the things were in uh, 1991, when, as Bill said, the West, the G7 meeting in London, did not come up with a package of uh, economic assistance and economic cooperation that could have helped Gorbachev and, who knows, perhaps could have helped avoid the attempted coup d'etat that so much weakened Gorbachev. So Gorbachev came uh, to London with um, uh, a speech that he delivered to the G7, which promised uh, bold economic reforms, but which was judged by Western leaders as not radical enough. And so they thought that while well, the economic ideas of Grigory Yavlinsky were more radical, were bolder, many of them at that time already believed that perhaps Yeltsin, the person who is more resolute, who would more decisively and more radically implement economic reform was their guy. And so the result was a communique that did not include any specific economic promises. And many people say this undermined Gorbachev. And so when the summit ended, Margaret Thatcher comes to the Soviet embassy to meet with Gorbachev. They regarded themselves, despite their enormous ideological differences, I mean, Thatcher could not hear the word socialism. I mean, no. Despite their ideological differences, Thatcher liked Gorbachev. They had developed trust and mutual respect. But she was no longer prime minister. The prime minister was John Major. And he was one of those Western leaders who had uh, not provided Gorbachev with the promise of economic assistance that perhaps could have helped save Perestroika. So, Thatcher comes, I interpret their meeting, and it's amazing. Without any prefaces, without any kind of introductory words, Thatcher comes out swinging. She says, what did those people do? How could they deny you the kind of help and assistance and support that you now need at this crucial moment in Perestroika? All those Western leaders with whom you met have shown themselves to be small people, small human beings, petty politicians, not real leaders. It was really amazing to me to hear that. You know, that that's what makes our work very interesting. It was certainly you know, not something that was top secret, but for some time, neither Gorbachev nor I mentioned it. Uh, but I think it characterizes, number one, Margaret Thatcher, it characterizes Gorbachev, he listened to her politely, he said that he still believed that there can be a new economic partnership between the Soviet Union and uh, the West, and it characterizes the fact that the political leaders whom we see, whom we discuss, whom we assess and evaluate, they are human beings. All of them were, I think, um, people of high quality in a political sense, in a human sense, but very much human beings. I think it's important to mention them, to mention Ronald Reagan, George Bush, Margaret Thatcher, Helmut Kohl, François Mitterrand, because they were the people who participated in the peaceful end of the Cold War, which is a miracle, and I think that the relatively peaceful transition from the totalitarian system to a new Russia was also a miracle, 
And so I think all of those people deserve a lot of credit and a tribute. Thank you. Yeah, well, you can join us for sure, but I will start with Pavel Palachenko. But please, no, no, sit down. It's all right. Um, Sorry. Please, no problem. <laughs> I think one of the first things we like to understand is the position you now have with Gorbachev. You still meet? Sure, I'm, I'm on the staff of the Gorbachev Foundation. Yeah. Um, as I think any you know, non-governmental foundation, uh, it's uh, not a place where you can... Uh, make a living, <laughs> so I also do a lot of other things. But that's where my office is, that's where Gorbachev uh, uh, comes, you know, three or four times a week at least, sometimes uh, every day. How is he doing? Uh, well, he is 86 years old and uh, it tells, but uh, generally, as I say, he wants to be active. He uh, writes um, articles, recently uh, worked on the book that has just been published, which is called, Indeed, I Remain an Optimist. And so my relationship with, with him is uh, personal, but at the same time, uh, it's um, a uh, working relationship. Uh, and um, that was a, a choice that uh, I made, and that's something that continues. Do you recognize what William Taubman tells in the book about the characteristics of Gorbachev, the fact that he is extremely smart, but sometimes also, therefore, a little bit criticizing his surrounding. Well, uh, Gorbachev has said that one of the uh, uh, problems and one of the uh, things that he regrets was that at some important moments, and in particular in August 1991, he was overconfident. And this overconfident. Over, overconfident, yeah. yes. And he says it was overconfidence to the point of conceit, to the point of, he doesn't use the word arrogance that Bill has used, but conceit is a pretty strong definition of a characteristic of which he himself is critical. So yes, I would say he, he generally uh, can uh, be quite self-critical. He believes that uh, he acted too late to start the decentralization of the Soviet Union. He believes that a more successful and deliberate process of decentralization, giving more powers to the republics, starting as early as maybe 86, 87, could have resulted in saving much of the union, in making it a voluntary union, but in keeping most of the republics together. But it was an amazing challenge, and I think, I, I think that probably impossible to do. How do you keep together a country that has at the same time Estonia and Turkmenistan? It was a big challenge, but what other, some people say, well, he should have accepted the end of the Soviet Union. Well, he accepted it when it happened, but how can you expect the leader of any country to say, well, okay, I don't care, class dismissed. You couldn't say that. So to some extent, it was perhaps overconfidence, perhaps some other uh, character flaws that any person has. But mostly it was the scale and the complexity of the uh, challenge that we have to bear in mind when we talk about what happened, what could have happened, and what didn't happen. Can you bring us back to 1997, when you were visiting Amsterdam for the first time? You sketch, 77. Yeah, 90, 1977. 77, yeah, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> um, you sketch an isolated country, which was the USSR at that time. But can you also help us to understand how you see the position of the West at that time? What was your idea, being from Russia, looking at the West? Well, in 1977 was still uh, what they call detente. Mm -hmm. It was before uh, the uh, before Soviet troops went into Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. The relationship was still not totally lost. 
there was still a possibility mm -hmm. of the Soviet Union and the West continuing at least detente and maybe moving toward more cooperation. Arms control treaties had been signed between Nixon and Brezhnev and they were still in force. It wasn't the worst possible time in relations between the Soviet Union and the West, but there were already warning signs that things were going in the wrong direction. For example, there were Cuban troops in Angola and um, the Soviet Union was also involved in that. Uh, there was, of course, the continuing crisis in uh, the Middle East and in other regions where the Soviet Union and the United States were on different sides of uh, those uh, conflicts. But as I said, there was still some expectation that perhaps we would be able to work things out. But if then you... Afghanistan happened. Yeah. Afghanistan happened in 79, and after that, rebuilding some kind of trust was enormously difficult. What Gorbachev inherited, as I say, in 85, was almost total isolation and bad relations with everyone that matters, the US, Europe, and China. And again, can you describe what that meant, for example, for you as being working for the government in Russia? Well, for me, it meant, of course, that uh, in my own position, which was basically purely technical, that is to say, an interpreter is someone who does technical work and who should think and concentrate only on how best to do his job. In that sense, I saw my objective, my goal, as perfecting my proficiency, my knowledge, because one has to have a lot of knowledge in order to comp competently interpret in negotiations. But on the other hand, of course, I was looking at what was happening and I saw the crucial relations with the countries that matter, as I said, going from bad to worse. So my, my own feelings at that time were quite skeptical, very negative, and that's why, like just about everyone else, I saw Gorbachev's arrival as uh, the hope for change. As the hope for change. And then there comes this miracle moment where you, as an interpreter, has to interpret the word glasnost. Yeah. What did you... Well, people, people say that glasnost is impossible to translate. And in this particular case... It was not in your book. Right, but in this, in this particular case, people very often say this word is untranslatable. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong. Glasnost is difficult to, to translate, not only because as some people say, it is less than freedom of speech. Perhaps so, but glasnost also means another thing, and that is openness of the government to the people. How do you translate a concept that includes both free speech and openness, accountability of the government to the people, transparency, all of those things in one word. So yeah, glasnost is difficult to translate. The world understood, the world liked it, and I think that that is still, it's interesting, you know, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, when he was president of uh, Russia, said, well, I don't care about the word glasnost because it's a lot less than freedom of speech. What we need is real freedom of speech. And I think that's a big mistake. Glasnost is more. Glasnost is still, I think, has to remain an objective, a goal, towards which we should move, rather than a purely historical term describing, you know, one of Gorbachev's policies. Putin thinks that the loss of the USSR was the biggest historic mistake Gorbachev ever made. That's not what he is saying. He said, he used the word, it was the biggest geopolitical catastrophe. Well, okay. Of the 20th century. Of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. He's not exactly accusing uh, Gorbachev of that, but he suggests, he hints, that in large part that was Gorbachev's fault. I frankly disagree with that because I think that the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century was probably the two world wars. And if he forgets about that, well, I wonder why. But the thing is that Gorbachev in part agrees with that. 
among other things, because he is uh, ethnically Russian, he knows that 25 million Russians became foreigners to Russia, became, in many cases, second-class citizens or non-citizens in the republics which seceded from the Soviet Union. So how can he uh, uh, not respond to that? He also knows that because the dissolution of the Soviet Union was done without a lawful procedure and without regard for the many problems that remained in the republics and between the republics, a lot of tragic things happened. There was a lot more loss of life as a result of the, this kind of breakup of the Soviet Union than during Perestroika. Perestroika was relatively bloodless. There was little bloodshed during Perestroika. After the breakup of the Soviet Union, What's there, Gorbachev? Was, this, there, 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 there yeah. was this, as I said, process that led to a lot of people, thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of people losing their lives. So yes, he too regards it as a catastrophe, but he accepts the fact that today, where there was Soviet Union, there are 15 independent republics. He accepts that, he recognizes that. Recognizes that. So uh, there is a difference between uh, how Putin treats it and how Gorbachev treats it. I understand. Yeah. What did he tell you about his personality in re regards of the detesting of violence, the fact that he likes it or not likes it? Um, what did he tell me about his yeah. personality? Yeah. Well, I, I don't think that we discussed that a lot. I mean, we, we became a lot closer uh, after uh, Perestroika, after he stepped down, as I said. I, but did, did he gave you any insight on his position towards the use of violence, for example, by the state? Well, I mean, he didn't have to tell me that. He has said that his goal throughout his uh, leadership was to avoid bloodshed, to avoid the use of force, to avoid violence. He has insisted always that when force was used, it was either against his wish or it happened because there was no alternative. For example, in Baku, when gangs of people were running around killing Armenians who remained in Azerbaijan. So something needed to be done, and so force was used to stop that violence. But his rejection of force, domestically or internationally, has been his uh, principle. And do all you the time. think? And, and he didn't need to tell me that. You know, he, no, I, understand. I think he, he proved that mm -hmm. by uh, his um, actions. As William Taubman says, it's maybe one of the reasons today's Russian say he was too weak. He didn't have this iron fist mm -hmm. as a leader. Well, I think a weak person wouldn't have been able to engineer that turn of the country away from the totalitarian system to a democratic process. And he understood the value of process. Whether people saw that as weakness, I don't know, but I think that in a democracy, the process is very often more important than the result. Because the result, when you move toward democracy, is always not final. There will be another leader, that's in the nature of things, who will change a lot of what he have achieved. The process is more important than the result. Compromise is more important than uh, the, the, the process of reaching a compromise. There's always evolution, there's always dynamic. I think Gorbachev was one of the few Soviet politicians who understood that. But then the question for you both, wasn't he extremely naive thinking that he was able to steer this process towards a democratic solution, towards a more open society, in the, the knowledge that, first of all, there wasn't any democratic tradition, that you had an overstretch, like you say, from Estonia to the Far East and the Far uh, North, mm -hmm. that there is this tradition of reigning with an iron fist instead of a more opening, listening attitude. We are talking about a complete naive sort of political position. You know, 
<clears throat> one thing that has to be said is that the confidence Gorbachev had that he could change his country and the world is characteristic of communism. I mean, what was communism trying to do in 1917 except change the country and the world? So in that sense, although I attribute much of what he does to his own character uh, and his own evolution and his own idealism and all the rest, the, this kind of overarching confidence that the world can be shaped, uh, that the world is in a sense perfectible, goes back into the tradition of communism itself. Although, of course, there were different kinds of communists and some were more brutal and some were more idealistic than others. Yeah, Gorbachev is often accused of being naive. He's also being accused today and, and more so 10, 15, 20 years ago of believing too much in socialism, of, of believing those socialist ideals, of believing that there can be a, a socialism with a human face. Well, I can tell you, had he not believed in that, Perestroika would never have started. There were other options. The option of doing very little at all, as I said, you know, Gorbachev cho chose action rather than inaction. There was also the option of actually sticking with the same confrontation with the West. There was the option of marrying the ideas of communism and the ideas of Russian nationalism. That, I think, is, is something that perhaps not described in Bill's book, but there was uh, a movement, I would say, within the Communist Party leadership that was in that direction. There was an option of basically the system degenerating into a kind of Ceausescu-style uh, leadership. All of those options were available. Gorbachev chose action. He chose change, he chose that, and without a belief in a kind of socialism with the human face, he never would have started. Without a belief that there can be a more democratic union, uh, a voluntary union of republics, he never would have started this uh, you know, process. So you have to have goals. Some of those goals prove to be attainable. Some of those goals prove to be not attainable. But you have to have goals. So I, I think that it's not naive to have okay. goals. It's so, not naive to believe, for example, in the socialism of the human face. Perhaps had we had some kind of a socialism with the human face, we would then have a capitalism with a more human face. Okay. Today, our capitalism is doesn't really have a human face, or, or, or it, it, the face is not human enough. So I, I would not, you know, dismiss those goals as, as being purely naive, because those goals contributed to the fact that he started changing the system. Okay. Talking about goals, what were the goals for 1992, 1993, if he had not had this coup d'etat? Did you find any of his writings or in his memoirs, his, his, his ways of looking at this then near future? Well, by 1991, of the 15 republics who initially constituted the Soviet Union, how many were left who wanted to be part of it? I lose track, Pavel. Was it no, six I, or I seven? Would or say, I would say that uh, he believed that um, six, seven, eight would sign the Union Treaty. With the others, they would continue to negotiate, and he believed in a multiple format union. So that, that was something that no one knows whether it was achievable, but certainly had there been some kind of an association between that voluntary union and Ukraine, possibly in defense, foreign affairs, a couple of other things, and that was possible before the coup. Before the coup, there was still a possibility. Even after the coup, there was a possibility of signing an economic agreement mm -hmm. that would have embraced at least 10, maybe 11 republic, and that, that was a lot. So he was exploring those possibilities. He was but a he realistic also person. also exploring this more pan-European partnership, the fact that he was willing to cooperate in a broader sense with, let's say, what the Americans called old Europe. Yes, he was. I mean, he, his notion extended beyond ending the Cold War to setting up a kind of new 
security architecture in Europe. He assumed that, that, that East and West would transcend their divisions and become part of a, as he called it, a common European home, which when he spoke those words sounded like propaganda, but he meant it. Um, he felt more comfortable with Western leaders. You were there, yeah, Pavel, sure, than he sure. did with the East European troglodytes. Yeah. Yeah. So he, you know, as East Europe began to break away in 1989, he was not upset by that. He thought that they would reform, and even if they went beyond reform to become non-communist, as long as they remained in the Warsaw Pact associated with the Soviet Union, that was fine. He saw, foresaw a gradual coming together of all of Europe. And even when uh, the Warsaw Pact ceased to exist in 1991, he uh, very much believed that some move from uh, the existing situation toward a more structured European system uh, would have neutralized the effects of the end of the Warsaw Pact while NATO continued to exist. In uh, 1990, NATO adopted a declaration in London which uh, proposed moving from a mostly military alliance to a more political alliance. Gorbachev believed that if that were accompanied with the creation of a European security architecture, possibly a kind of European Regional Security Council, that would have been a move toward a greater Europe, toward a united Europe, a more united Europe, not a totally united Europe, but politically you know, a better Europe, a healthier Europe. And that was not done, even though some other leaders, including Genscher, Mitterrand, some others, said that the idea of a European Security Council was a good idea. You know, on this yeah. question, Pavel, I'd like to ask you, uh, Gorbachev has been very critical of the expansion of NATO yep. and sometimes almost as critical as Putin of the behavior of the West. Uh, and one of the things I've wondered is to what extent that reflects his sense that the West betrayed him, that Baker said you were probably there at, the, at, this, at this, uh, these talks. Baker said that NATO would not expand one inch to the east. And it hasn't. It's expanded thousands of miles. So, <laughs> well, yeah. but, but he said that in the context of discussions about Germany. Yes. At that time, even the idea that uh, Romania or Czechoslovakia would become a member of NATO was not on anyone's mind. That was 1989. So how could that, that be regarded as a promise about Hungary or about Poland? It was a promise that the infrastructure of NATO, uh, like nuclear weapons, like uh, additional military infrastructure, uh, foreign troops on East German territory, that that would not happen. And all of that was included in the treaty on the final settlement mm -hmm. with Germany that was signed in 1990. And that actually is still being complied with. That still is being fulfilled. That is to say there are no nuclear weapons in the territory of former GDR, no additional troops, there are no weapons of mass destruction. There are no major military maneuvers in uh, that part of Germany. And uh, another very important promise, the personnel uh, of the German armed forces has been reduced by about 40% of the United Germany. 40% of the former uh, army of the FRG. So all those promises have been fulfilled. What Gorbachev is saying is that when NATO started to expand, and that started in like 1993, when talk about that began, that was the violation of the spirit of the agreements that were signed and that concerned Germany. They did not concern Eastern Europe, because at that time, Eastern Europe was still within the Warsaw Pact. But he is, I would say, accusing the West. It's not like he was betrayed. He is accusing the West of breaching the spirit of the agreement that was signed regarding Germany. But, I mean, talking about accusing, I mean, I can imagine that he felt alone and left alone when he learned in the coup d'etat moment in 1991 that the West was already connected to Yeltsin. 
that the West was waiting to see what was happening. And of course, they were no, happy. No, no, I don't think so. I don't no? think so. No, the, the, the West, there was some vacillation uh, regarding how to react to the coup on the part of Mitterrand, on the part perhaps of President Bush. Yes. But they, the next day, they took a strong position against the coup. They said that they still recognize Mikhail Gorbachev as the president of the Soviet Union. And uh, there was no talk about waiting for Yeltsin. At that time, the question was whether the coup wins or whether the constitution and the presidency of Mikhail Gorbachev is restored. So that, that was a totally different situation. He felt that the West abandoned him after the coup, yes. But I would say, I, I would you know, approach that uh, in a more balanced way. Okay. It, was, it was not the West that was decisive in those events, not the West. It was the fact that the coup weakened Gorbachev and domestically made Yeltsin politically the stronger figure. The West had nothing to do with that. You cannot say that the West planned the coup. I understand. <laughs> But Mr. Taubman, can we say that we in this period, this decisive period of 1991-1993, West and East were like ships passing in the night, finding ground for a more pan-European cooperation, to have this zero uh, uh, game towards zero um, uh, nuclear arms? Did we miss an historic opportunity? Well, it's, it's not the subject of my book, but my understanding is that Yeltsin, in that regard, continued Gorbachev's pro-Western approach. Although if you read about his relations with Clinton in those years in the book by Strobe Talbot, you see it was tumultuous. In fact, it reminds me of Kennedy and Khrushchev, mm -hmm. you know. people of Russia, because it was the Russian people who had suffered so much 40 years before and who every poll at that time demonstrated, accepted German unification. But Pavel, you can also... He had the support of the Russian people. He had the support of the people who had suffered so much during the war and who had accepted that German, the German people had the right to unify. I'm just curious, you can also state that those developments were... Mike. Uh, Yeah. Those developments were so fast happening that it simply could not cope, the system itself could not cope with the fastness of the developments. Absolutely. As I said, by that time, by the time they were discussing what kind of Germany, whether it would be totally united or some kind of confederation, whether that country, unified country, would be a member of NATO and something, they had been overtaken by events. Right. That's okay. it. Question. Uh, in Western countries, the ideas or the idea of implementing Western ideas in Russia and other countries in the world as liberal democracy, free capitalism, liberalism, moral, are celebrated. But I know that in Russia there are quite a lot of people who state we don't need this idea. We have to uh, choose our own way. How do you comment this? Is this true? And what's the way uh, Russia should or could go if it does not accept Western ideas? Well, I don't know. I, I mean, uh, quite a few people now would say that they do not, um, they're not particularly happy about uh, Western values, Western ideas. On television today in uh, uh, Russia, you can see people um, being very anti-Western, saying that democracy, um, a free market, in particular liberalism, is not what we want. But even those people very much like the products of those values. So I, I don't accept that. Frankly, it's, it's, it's a complicated process. Uh, Russia adjusting to democracy, Russia adjusting to uh, periodic change of government, Russia adjusting to more entrepreneurship. It's a difficult process. That I accept. But uh, it's, it's inevitable that things will move in that direction. Because as I said, people who criticize Western values very much like the products of those Western values. Some of the propagandists who are now criticizing Western values on 
Russian television have property in the West. They have bank accounts in the West. They have children uh, studying in the West. So okay. I, I, I think it, there's a lot of hypocrisy. One or two last questions. Thing. Please introduce yourself. My name is uh, Kasper van Dijk. I have a question on uh, popularity. Um, it strikes me that he's maybe the only Russian leader who has enjoyed popularity here in the West, maybe not always in the Soviet Union. Was being liked, being popular, important to Mr. Gorbachev? Was there a strategy um, to, be, to be liked, or was it merely a byproduct of his actions? Well, I don't know any politician who doesn't like to be liked. But it was more a byproduct, I would say. Obviously, uh, he enjoyed that, but he did not start his reforms and he did not turn around the Soviet foreign policy in order to be liked. That's for sure. Okay. I saw you. Yeah. Let's see if we... Uh, no, I do is. Yeah. Please introduce uh, yourself. Artemy Kalinowski. Uh, I'm about halfway through the book, uh, Professor Stalman. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, my question concerns style and substance. Uh, we get a sense that in terms of the substance of his reforms, it's clear where they're coming from, right? They're being produced in think tanks. There's a lot of people who are thinking about ways to reform the Soviet Union. But you have this great description of right after he becomes general secretary and he's out in the crowd in, in Leningrad uh, and, and his interaction with, with ordinary people on the street. Where does his style as a politician comes from? Because he really is unlike all the people who, who, who could have trained him uh, as, as this kind of politician? Well, my, my guess is, is the mic working? Yes. Yeah. My guess is that it wasn't so, matter, so much a matter of calculation, but of being himself. Uh, as uh, Pavel said earlier, he was a moral politician. He wanted to be understood by the people. He wanted to help people. Uh, he wanted to reach out and touch people. Uh, all of that helped him a lot. It looked very clever, but my, f and, and he did work at it. I talk a bit about that in the book too, but I think it was essentially, the, that's who he was. It was his personality. And I would disagree somewhat about uh, what you said, that the reforms uh, were being, had been kind of carefully thought through in the think tanks that uh, there were some economic uh, programs of um, moving away from the old rigid Soviet economic system toward a freer system. One of the problems that made changing the Soviet economy so difficult was that the Soviet intellectuals, the Soviet economists, had not really prepared for a process of change. And so when Gorbachev started reforms. There was no consensus in the intellectual community about where you move economically. I would tell you this, without glasnost, without free speech, even the words private property wouldn't be uttered. Even when glasnost started, very few people boldly said, you know what, we need private property, we need privatization. Those words became common and familiar only in 1991. The system was extremely rigid. Gorbachev did fail with the economic reform, but that was because there was this economic bureaucracy that couldn't be defeated without political I change. Just, I describe a Politburo meeting, or perhaps a meeting of Gorbachev and his advisors, where they're sitting around trying to come up with the Euf the proper euphemism for private property. Exactly. They're, exactly. They're, they're talking, they have all kinds of complicated formulations to avoid saying the words private property, even though that's what they mean. But that's, it's, it's, it's interesting that once the society was ready to accept that, again, because of Gorbachev's leadership, and also, I would say, because of the radicalism of Boris Yeltsin, within a few months, the whole idea of private property as the basis for the economy became accepted uh, by just about everyone. Okay. That, that was an amazing mm -hmm. change. You know? I'd like to thank you so much for this talk. I think we have learned today that history is really sort of sum of individuality of the persons on the act.
the situations in history on that very moment. Also the fact that there's sometimes simply not a plan B when you have opened the room. And that in the end, uh, history is judging always, as they say, by the eyes of the one who is on top. So let's see how this will develop for the upcoming years. I thank you very, very much for uh, your insight, uh, informative uh, talks. Pavel Palachensko and William Taupin, give them a big hand. There will be uh, more. There will be more documentaries being shown on uh, on screen here in the Bali for the upcoming month, October. Um, Mr. Taubman is now available for signing his book, which you can buy in front of the Bali. Then you bring it back, so he can easily sit here and have a small talk uh, with the ones who like. Thank you so much.